in the U.S. And good morning to folks over near Australia, New Zealand area. It's always interesting to me that we can be talking to somebody who is a day ahead of us at uh, 930 in the morning, uh, Bronnie's time, and we're able to have a nice chat today. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us this uh, afternoon slash morning. Uh, before we get in and introduce Bronnie, I'd like to know where everybody's coming from. So if you don't mind in the comments, if you can just drop a quick where you're at, where you're coming from, and maybe what profession you're in. I know we have different professions, uh, massage therapists, PTs, chiros. i uh, love to hear where you guys are coming from. Um, I'm excited. I've been already picking Bronnie's brain for the last probably 20, 30 minutes. We've got on and had a nice little chat already. Um, so we've got some awesome stuff we're going to be able to talk to you guys about today. Um, so I'm excited to share uh, some of uh, Bronnie's, well, Bronnie's going to share a lot of her wisdom. Uh, I've, if you've been online and you've ever wanted to read about patient communication and acceptance commitment therapy and motivational interviewing, uh, healthskills.wordpress.com, I believe, is, a, is the uh, blog. And Bronnie's wrote an amazing blog that has so many pearls of wisdom in there. I can't uh, recommend it enough to go over there and check that out if you want to get more skilled at this stuff. Um, looks like we got Josh coming in, Kiersey from Finland. Good to see some of our Finn colleagues here today. That's at midnight. Very nice. Very nice. That's dedication right there. Um, with no further ado, let's bring Bronnie into the podcast or podcast into the broadcast. Thanks for joining us, Bronnie. We really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. And it's a beautiful spring day here in Christchurch. A little chilly, mm -hmm. but um, absolutely glorious outside. So. Yeah, looking forward to today's chat. Yeah, it looks like we got some folks from the U.S., from South Africa as well. So but one of the things that uh, kind of prompted this, we had pulled the group and you were the top respondent of what people wanted to hear about or hear from. And for good reason, you've established yourself as really an authority in a lot of this uh, stuff that we're going to talk about today. One of the things that was of interest, uh, and I think it was uh, Sam Rasmussen or I, Simon, I, I hope I didn't butcher his name. But uh, he had mentioned Socratic dialogue and communication, and we've already had a little chat about this. But I'm curious, with how do you approach the patient interview from maybe that Socratic questioning, Socratic dialogue perspective? And, and maybe what are the limitations of trying to really have an algorithm or a protocol of that? We've talked about that a little bit already. If people could fit into little boxes, we'd be fine not needing to listen and talk to people. But we we don't. People aren't like that. So Socratic questioning is really trying to draw out from the person to understand where they're coming from, to really put yourself into that person's shoes. Because as I commented earlier, um, you know, people don't start off in, at the beginning of the day to say, oh, I'm going to really make a dumb decision. They really don't. You know, we all try to make a good decision based on what we know at the time. My partner's just heading out to paddle. It's a um, beautiful day out there. Um, so, so Socratic questioning is really trying to understand based on open-ended questions, how did you get to this situation? How? What happened? And it's meant to be um, curious. You're meant to have this, well, you do have this curiosity about what's really going on. How did you get to this point? And not trying to judge it in any way, but really listen and then reflect what you've listened, what you've heard. Yeah, we spoke a little bit about how John Quintner and Milton Cohen's kind of third space, you know, that that kind of creation of this space where it is that kind of open exchange of non-judgmental allowing the patient to have their unique culture and values and uh, experiences come to the table. Um, so Socratic dialogue obviously can help us with that. And uh, one of the things we had had a live stream earlier this week with Ben Cormack, Rika Holopainen and Gilletta Belton, which as you know, Gilletta always brings that awesome patient perspective. What are some ways you think as clinicians, sometimes I think we get so stuck in that clinician communication role that we forget about the human role. I mean, what do you think, how do you balance that in your encounters with somebody versus, you know, trying to interrogate their tissues and their symptom behavior to try to get this treatment threshold versus I need to listen to the story of this human in front of me? Yeah. Um, I'm, I have the good fortune of having an hour with people, um, and especially in the first 
time I meet them. So having an hour means I've got lots of time to really um, hear what they're saying. But I do have a semi-structured interview that's been based on oh, years of years of experience in doing this. So, um, and it guides people from so how did it all start and what's your experience and what's your theory about what's going on for you and how does it affect you? Kind of takes people on this journey um, that typically people are wanting. I think the challenge is to. Um, to sometimes you need to just guide and say, hey, we need to move on to something else. I need to know about this. Um, and that I do that by reflecting. Um, so we've been talking blah, blah, blah about this. And I'm really interested in this part. And I know that you'd like to tell me more, but we just need to find out about this so I can help you. So it's just kind of being open and, and honest about that, um, that it's a mutual exchange of they want to give me stuff, I need to know stuff. So let's navigate that together. Um, I do think, so physiotherapists have this tendency to call it the, the subjective. And you know, subjective has this really negative connotation. It's not real, it's not true, it's not, um, it's not nearly as valuable as this objective stuff. But I'd like to challenge people think about your objective testing and just think about why you chose the test what started that process how you conduct it how accurate are you do you follow the protocol or do you just change it a little bit because each of those changes invalidates that and makes it subjective so if it's a subjective thing you know, why should we value that perspective any more than what the person is telling us about their experience? So I would really like to, to challenge physiotherapists. Let's not call it subjective. Let's call it an interview. Let's talk about interviewing. Yeah, and, and that fits so much more with what we know science is telling us around pain is that patient narrative component and I, I just had somebody recently comment to me about changing it to let's get let's get their narrative instead of get their get their uh, you know subjective because again yeah. it, it does have that connotation and I you know I have, that's something I didn't really consider and I think I'm gonna have to change you know some of my documentation now after talking to you but <laughs> yeah, I, I think bringing that human part into it and uh, especially knowing how much of these psychosocial factors you know we have such strong research that blows biomechanics and arthrocriminics out of the water as far as predictability and prognostic abilities when it comes to pain, um, that it sure makes sense that we should be um, discussing these psychosocial issues and getting, you know, the patient and considering that they're, we're starting to see now the physiology research starting to bring these two things together where these cognitions and behaviors are changes in stress systems and cortisol and all these different things that now can have some, because I think clinicians just struggle with, you know, ambiguity we talked about that gray area and uh, different things what do you see i mean in occupational therapy i think you guys and we've talked a little bit about this before we went live is ot's have been kind of ahead of the game with cognition and function and getting people to do and all the things and you know i think some there has been a little bit of like pts thinking we've reinvented something that's already been invented quite a bit and maybe just helped with some of the science nudging along and getting on board with it would be more appropriate. But uh, kind of to segue a little bit, we did have a question with occupational therapists and somebody had a perception that OTs maybe weren't as dominant in that sphere, at least in their view in the US. I mean, where do you feel occupational therapists as part of the big team that we know probably is gonna be the best approach with folks as far as not one profession figuring this all out. Where do you think the OT role maybe has been traditionally and where it is now, maybe where you'd like to see it go? Yeah, um, so one of the things that I try to steer away from is calling it the physio role or the occupational therapy role, because that says, oh, this is my stuff, don't touch it. But actually, when we're looking at people who are working with people living with pain, our contributions overlap. There is far more commonality between physiotherapy, occupational therapy, psychology, social work, nursing, um, and all the other manual therapies, then there is differences. 
And so I would like to think that occupational therapy is um, an old profession, and I don't know that everybody realises that we started way back at the turn of the century looking at um, the moral treatment of people with psychiatric disorders. So at that time, people were shoved into basically storage and we left to rot really and Adolf Meyer as a psychologist said or psychiatrist actually said hey people that do things um they actually get better and so occupational therapy was started on the basis that when people are involved and engaged in life they do stuff and and if we can help them achieve that then we are helping them recover so as time evolved, um, the TV, TB, tuberculosis epidemics, occurred in New Zealand anyway, and there were returning soldiers who were lying for months and months doing absolutely nothing and going stir crazy. Occupational therapists got involved there. So one of the key focuses of my profession is on that doing is healthy, and engaging in occupation, which is all the things that we do and we need to do, um, that those processes are both a treatment and they're also an outcome. So we get better by doing. And, you know, physiotherapy owns that by we get people exercising. Well, exercising is a doing. So is walking, so is gardening, so is um, dancing and occupational therapy just adds that element that says if it's important to you if it's something you want to or need to do then your motivation is that much greater so let's buy into that and that is really how occupational therapy works so when pain intervenes with somebody's life it stops them first of all they stop doing fun things you know, let's not go out and hang out with our mates. Let's not do the leisure things that we used to do because we need to preserve energy for getting up and getting dressed and all the self-care stuff and going to work and maybe doing therapy. But if you lose fun, what happens to that connection with other people? What happens to all that endorphins? Um, what happens to that positive buzz that makes you feel good? So occupational therapy would say, let's put some fun back in. Um, and there's been a, a bit, a bit more research recently showing that exercise is actually really boring for many people, and it's a frightening thing for many people with pain. So let's build in the things that people want and love to do. So most people would know that I'm not an exercise person. I like to walk, I like to cycle, but I'm not going to go to the gym. But I dance and I do the tidy the house if I have to. Um, and I do the lawns and I do the garden and I walk the dogs. So I'm active, but I don't do exercise. And the idea that we do corrective exercise has been slowly fading, suggesting that perhaps occupational therapists' ability to titrate the demands of an occupation is that something that we are trained to do, to analyse what it is that somebody's doing, not just from a biomechanical perspective, but from a psychological, a social, an anthropological, um, thinking about the what does this mean to this person, looking at all the types of demands that occur as this person engages in this occupation. And occupational therapists can titrate that to the level that the person can, can currently manage. And then we start to make it harder, graded exposure. Mm -hmm. So it's much broader than just thinking, I oh, will get this person to start on three reps of, you know, 10 reps of three or whatever it is that physios like to do. But actually, why can't we get this person out playing? Um, we need to get them walking. Why don't we start them doing some geocaching? Use a phone, go look for stuff or taking photographs. So one of my patients, um, we got him out of the house. He wanted to go and do more. So what he had to do was post a photo a day of the places he'd been because that meant something to him. So I think that's how occupational therapy can contribute in a way that complements and 
actually supports the other professions that are working with that person in terms of taking stuff out of a clinic and into the daily life of that person. That's what we're really interested in. No, I, I love it. And I think that's such a huge component to getting somebody well. My curiosity is, you know, in PT traditionally, we've had this really pain contingent program with people of like, you know, give me your number one to 10. What's it? Okay, I do this technique. What is your pain now? What's your pain? What's your pain? What's your pain? Yeah. And just talking about it, we can see how that would conflict with doing because I'm just going to speak from my own experience. I know this resonates with some of my colleagues because we've had these discussions as far as sometimes this thought of I need to change the pain, change the pain, change the pain. It's a barrier to you just getting the patient back to doing something and doing something they value and doing something that gives them meaning and, and some hope. Um, and I honestly think I've just, again, speaking for myself, that I've been a barrier to my patient's recovery with that. What, what are your thoughts from, you know, is what's the balance of, because, you know, with acute tissue injury and things, there might be some things where we should be mindful of. And I know that's not a lot of what you probably see in your practice. It sounds like you're more in the persistent pain game, which in that situation, probably not the best idea to be very pain contingent at all. And in fact, probably a barrier. Would you agree? Yeah, it is. Um, but even in acute pain, so imagine you've sprained your ankle. Mm -hmm. Do you wait till your pain has gone before you do stuff? No, we have to start doing things. Mm -hmm. And it is normal to moderate what you're doing when you have a sprained ankle. And But you're not really using pain as a guide. You're using what you need to do as a guide. So I don't care about... Oh, that sounds... I. I don't measure pain. Um, the first time I see the person, I'll talk about what it's like, and then I don't measure at all. And the, one of the reasons for that is that pain intensity fluctuates wildly. It fluctuates depending on your attention, on your distress levels, on your stress levels, on how important it is to you. And so it's not going to be a consistent measure. So if you say, well, I can't move above a three out of 10, chances are you're going to have a very variable level of activity. And one of the things we want to do for both acute and persistent pain is help people to become more consistent in their activity levels. So we say for an acute pain problem, um, you need to do X number of these activities and you need to do them over this period of time well that's pretty much what I do <laughs> so it's not about the pain intensity at all um there's some things that people with persistent pain tend to do and this is a um, an area that I'm interested in investigating people do notice their pain they're scanning and that's something that people with persistent pain just do and in an in a behavioral approach that's thought to be very bad must not scan your pain, must not do that. Um, but actually it's rubbish because people just do that. So what I try to do is say, let's, let's work out what your pain means to you. How is it interfering? How much can you manage? And then can we add some values in? So if I have a, um, I've got a bloke, we have lots of blokes in New Zealand, <laughs> and he had bilateral upper limb pain. And he was a keen motorcyclist. But he'd been told he shouldn't do that. Um, he shouldn't go riding on his bike because he's got this persistent pain in his upper limbs, neuropathic pain. So I asked him, because he was not a very um, adherent man, shall we say. He didn't follow rules. So I asked him, have you ever gone out on your motorbike since this? Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, what happened to your pain? Oh, it went up. And... Um, was it worth it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we, I said to him, well, that's okay. Go for, go for it. So that was one way of bringing him on board was to help him see that, yes, it in increased his pain, but that didn't mean it was harming him. And if it's worth it, do it. Because he'd lost that. He thought that his life was going to be constrained to this little boring computer tasks and uh, they tried. This is this is a very outdoorsy guy, and they said, "Oh, you need to learn first aid, and you need to learn computing, and you need to go into an office job." It's not going to happen. <laughs> so we just said, "Well, it's okay. You can go out on your motorbike. You can do stuff." And um, he did. 
and his attitude shifted extraordinarily. I wouldn't say he's perfect. I wouldn't say he's re completely recovered, but he's on board with it's okay to do things that hurt as long as it's worth it. So that buys into the um, acceptance and commitment therapy kind of approach where you're committed to doing things that matter and you're willing to experience discomfort, whether it's emotional or, or pain, um, in order to do things that matter to you. And I just love that. I think that's very common. Yeah. No, and uh, we'll, we're going to get to more uh, ACT, but we have one question here that I wanted to, to bring up here. Um, Casey had asked a question of, for those in acute pain who just, quote, want to be fixed, because we do see that narrative coming through the clinic, do you find they prefer the provider to just treat them versus taking responsibility themselves? Well, the way I go about that is asking them what, you know, who else can feel your pain? You're the only person that can say whether it's helping or not. So essentially, you are taking responsibility for what's going on. And I think it's that balance, knowing that as a clinician, um, and I don't treat very acute patients, um, I can't actually do anything. In fact, none of us can do anything really about another person's pain experience. They're the only ones that are doing it. We're facilitating a process. We can't change it. So they need to, and I make this really clear with the ones who've had, you know, very early onset, um, I see them in these subacute phases, that they need to tell me what's helping and what's not helping. That's their responsibility. And I'll help them figure out stuff. And I also point out that they're only going to see me for an hour. The rest of the week, they're on their own, buddy. And that means that they need to do things that help and things that will not harm so how do we get that balance so it's not about none of us can directly affect somebody else's pain what we can do is provide um, a context or an environment where they can explore um, playing with their pain and finding out what helps and what doesn't help for them and i guess that's the um, i treat most of my treatments as an experiment because i really don't know what's going to help and I would challenge anybody to really know what's going to help. And I think that's the crux of it as we delve into especially, you know, pain in general. Um, you know, we want to say that and to my knowledge, there is yet to be an RCT that shows 100 percent success rate with every patient. Nicely. Apparently, human beings are complex. It's crazy. Yeah. Data, but I, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. How do you help a clinician? Because I see this regularly when we instruct clinicians and when we t uh, teach students in university and things as far as they want that concrete, they want the algorithm, they want the certainty of um, this is what I do in this situation um, for this patient and they want that just to fall in the line and they quickly realize when they get in the clinic, there is no, it's all over the place. It doesn't obviously fit that. How do you help what would be some words of uh, maybe wisdom or advice you'd give to those clinicians on how to be comfortable with the uncertainty, I guess I would say? Yeah, I think it, it's probably the difference between being a technician and being a professional. So technicians don't know the concepts underpinning what they're doing. They're just following the rules. But if we are professionals, then we have to understand the concepts. So most of the time we apprentice into learning these things as we go through our original training and then we start to develop better conceptual models of what's going on and that helps us to become more comfortable with um, applying the principles rather than the the step-by-step -step process but there's nothing wrong with scaffolding um, some support around somebody as they're learning a new principle so breaking it down putting some um, putting some hints so the scaffolds could be um, try this one thing in your treatment um, put some prompts down in your diary so you've got some responses to make um, and to treat that as an experiment to see what happens allowing the other person the, the responses from your patient to guide whether it's helping or not and then gradually extend that and become more confident as you go through it's um when I was starting to implement motivational interviewing and ACT, I found that um, I was heartened actually by 
the advice that you can't do it wrong. The only thing that can happen is that it might not work as well this time and you'll learn something. And actually that's what we do when we're learning, we experiment, we try it and it might not work perfectly. And then we go back and we think, now I wonder what I could do differently. Isn't that what we're doing with the people that we are trying to help? We're giving them an option, we let them try it out and seeing whether it fits for them. And then they decide mm, that bit worked, but that bit didn't. So then they integrate it in their way into their life. We're doing the same with as clinicians. So a little bit of, um, I guess, confidence that I can't stuff it up. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to backfire and this person's not going to die as a result of it. They might get a bit of a flare up. They might get a bit grumpy because you're not doing what they expect. And that teaches you something. I was going too far, too fast, or I was not listening carefully enough. I wasn't being guided by that person. So, yeah, try it and see. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, I, I, as I've delved into MI and ACT, I can definitely uh, relate to that as far as definitely having communication scenarios where it just falls flat, doesn't go well. <laughs> But I think you nailed it. It's it's a learning experience. Then next time, hopefully, you you face a similar circumstance or a similar situation. You say, okay, that didn't work in the past. Maybe I'll go this route and try this road to see if we can nudge somebody in a, a more positive direction. So yeah, I'm curious. You had mentioned some of the kind of uh, before we got on here of like some of the exercises you might do with patients. I like the one you talked about with the hands in front of the face. You might share that with the folks, but. I, just any of those type of tidbits that you know can maybe help people better understand that you know because we see patients definitely speak from the physio side of things where um, unless you're in a more of a pain rehab setting where pe patients are in this mindset of I need to be fixed there's something you need to identify tell me what it is and do something to it and they're still in this very pain contingent their yeah. their life and their existence revolves around their pain and how they're going to cure it. Um, and you're coming in, and we're coming in, I should say, and trying to move somebody to say, okay, what if it's okay for you to have that and still pursue your valued goals? What are some things you find helpful to maybe steer some steer patients, maybe some communication strategies or something that uh, might help a clinician get a patient to move away from that pain contingent lifestyle? I think um, one of the things is to ask the person, what's, what are they missing? What, what's missing from your life so if pain was less of a problem for you what would you be doing you watch you watch the person's face change instead of talking about all the interference that pain has and knowing all the things they can't do what would you be doing if pain was less of a problem for you now i'm not saying i'm going to take it away just less of a problem and you watch their low face light up and they say well i'd be out walking the dog and I'd be spending more time with my family and I'd be going to work and then I thought that sounds fantastic I wonder how we could start doing some of those things now because we don't know what's going to happen with your pain we don't know whether it's going to settle down all by itself or it's going to be lumpy and bumpy which is the usual um, so are you willing to try doing some of these things anyway you know, how can we do some things that make you feel like you? That's probably been my theme phrase <laughs> clinically recently, saying what can we do that makes you feel like yourself again? Because you lose all these things. And people are readily telling you all the things that they're losing. What we often don't hear is what they'd really love to be doing. So I want to be a really good dad. What do dads do and how do they do it? Well, they play rough and tumble with the kids. They go kick a ball around. They do the barbecue. It's a very blokey thing to do barbecue. <laughs> um, and, and so well, I wonder if there are things that you could do that are just as important to your child that are also about being a great dad. Maybe it's about sitting with your child as they're going off to sleep and reading a story maybe it's about um, sitting down at the end of the day when they come in with their homework and instead of being you know just doing the rough and tumble sitting down and saying hey I don't know how to do these let's google let's do it together so um, I guess what I look for are 
different expressions of the things that are important to people, different ways of doing that. Um, and that seems to take away the, I've got to get rid of it. Um, some, of the, some of the little tricks I do. So for those of you that are listening, if you've got your hands free and you're not just keying on the keyboard, just get your hands up like this, right? And some of you will have done this, so don't let the secret out. And what I want you to do is just clasp your hands together. Okay? Now notice which, thing, which thumb is on top. Left or right? Okay? Now I just want to release your hands, shake them out, okay, now this time I want you to clasp your hands together but put the other thumb on top, which takes a bit of doing, <laughs> so I do this with people, and they say, well, you know, what's different, what's that like, and they'll say, oh, that's slow, it feels really weird, just doesn't fit, it's, you know, I, it's not right, and that's what happens when we're learning a new way of living, either with pain or to change what we do. So it takes longer. You have to think about it. It doesn't fit quite as nicely. It's not as automatic. Um, but it's still the same thing. We're still clasping our hands together, but we're just doing it differently. And then after a little bit of time, I get them to do it again. So just put your hands up, okay, and just clasp your hands together. Which thumbs on top? And it's usually the one that you started with. And what does that show you? Well, it shows you that when push comes to shove and you're not thinking, you're going to go back to the old way because it feels familiar, it feels comfortable, it feels right. And change is like that. Change doesn't feel right. It takes a lot of work and effort, whether it's an acute injury and you're doing some exercises or it's a long-term pain problem and you're trying to navigate how do I live, it feels odd to do it differently. And when you're under pressure or you're not thinking, you go back to your old way of doing it. That's um, it's kind of a nice little reminder. Um, and that one came from, oh, years and years and years ago. I can't remember who I learned that one off. I crib things like that. Um, the one with the hands, though, and, and the... the um, pain and trying to help people understand how much pain gets in the way so I'm talking to somebody about how much they believe that pain needs to be gone and I get them to put their hands up and if the distance from their face is how strongly they believe it so the closer they are to their face they really believe it it's really 100% the further away or oh, no it's okay so how far, how closely do you believe that your pain is, has to be gone? So I put it right up. Most people put their hands up by their face. And then I ask them, can you make me a cup of tea or coffee? And you know what? I can't do it. And that's like that belief. You believe really strongly it's got to be gone. And life goes on hold because you've got that right up by your face and so just loosening that I'm not asking you to drop that belief completely but just loosening that so you can do and Linda does a similar thing with signing your name differently perfect so just how can you do it differently can you loosen that hold is that okay are you willing to try it if it's important to you it's part of act um, because we do hold on to those thoughts and beliefs really strongly. Um, and that ability to play with it, um, you have to be have a good rapport with the person. They have to believe that you're not laughing at them. You need to ask permission. Is it okay if we try something a little bit funny, a little bit weird? Um, the other one I use is the um, Chinese finger trap. I use that a lot. So you put the fingers in the in the trap. I haven't got one handy in my office here. Um, and you ask them, so now try and get your hands out of it. Try and pull your fingers out of it. And it grabs tighter and tighter. And that's what we do. Normally, we try to get escape from this problem. But actually, the only way to get out of a Chinese finger trap is to just wiggle. 
So in the programs that I run, I call it, we're going to get some wiggle room. Let's find some wiggle room so you can get out. Little changes that allow you a little bit more freedom from I'm all I'm going to do is look after this pain and get rid of it. Um, and they're not new. These are from acceptance and commitment therapy. Lots and lots of um, playful little games available on the net. Um, search and you'll you'll find them. Just little illustrations, experiential illustrations that um, can convey something different that from our words. Um, you might have seen the one that um, Tamar Pinkus did with the with the plasticine. So she has a lump of plasticine. I use play doh. Um, and then she says, puts this different colour on it, a little speck of that, and says, that's what acute pain is like. And we can just take that little speck off when it's acute pain. But when it's been on for a long time, when it starts to get mashed inside who you are, we can't remove that so easily. In fact, we can't remove it at all. You become a different you. And that's what happens with long-term pain. And so how can you become more like you? Well, you have to add some more of your original colour to be the right colour, to be you again. And even then, you'll never be exactly the way you were. And that's lovely because people get it. They can play with it and they know that that's what that's true. Even if you can't, even if you've got the pain removed, you've still got those memories You've still got that experience that you've been through and that changes you as a person. And that's okay, as long as we are willing to learn from that and experience it. And I would never tell somebody, oh, it's a very good learning experience to have pain. You just get slapped down for that, and rightly so. But this done in a spirit of compassion, of curiosity, a little bit of playfulness, um, a little bit of honesty, that, you know, this is what's happened to me. I will use an example from my life. And and that gets you on the same level with the person. And that's so important because I have never yet heard a patient say, oh, oh they listened too much. Ever. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, manual therapists are often scared that people want to, people will feel that they're getting talked at they and as long as you say at the beginning i'm really want to understand how things have been for you actually by the end of it emphasizing i'm hearing you is so much more affirming than i'm sitting back and you know telling you stuff and doing things to you yeah well that kind of goes along with uh steve camper's study recently about what do patients want in chronic low back pain from a clinical encounter and 60 percent wanted to talk about things in their life which yep. um so are we meeting the patient's expectations and all that and i think you know this stuff does if we actually let them talk about things in their life and we show interest in different things let me bring up a question we had edwan uh, had a question I've met patients who had no specific meaningful activity. There's nothing they want to go back to, nothing they are particularly passionate about, nothing they want to um, uh, get back to, but they want their pain to go away. In these cases, would you recommend helping them find and dig up meaningful activity, or do you work with what they've given you? Um, I am just starting to work with, I'll show you this, I have lots of things, the ACT matrix which is a simplified version of, of ACT um, by Kevin Polk, and I really like it. And what he suggests is saying, who is important to you? Because who is, everybody's got someone that's important to them. How do you show that? How can we help enrich that relationship? And you will find there are little things that people will be doing or that they would like to do more of and I think that might be one of the ways to help people get that sense of meaning. Um, Kevin goes through, uses this matrix, which is very simple, but um, but I think just asking who's important in your life, who's important to you, how can we help you have a better connection with that person? And that will start that conversation going, I think. No, that's great. That's great. Um... I had a kind of a, I guess a little bit of a uh, different topic uh, here is, 
some of the things, because I'm sure you bump into this, and I, I think I've seen discussions online where we've discussed this, where uh, patients are coming to you, but they're also intervening with or interacting with clinicians who may not have the most up-to-date view on pain and still want to pull people into that, you know, structure, weakness, frailty narrative that really can pull them out of the things that we're trying to move them into. So I'm curious, um, any strategies you find helpful for that or how you can, obviously we're not going to say, hey, that guy you're seeing is an idiot. You shouldn't listen to him. I mean, we got to show some professionalism. Um, but uh, how do you approach that? Any uh, suggestions or things you think we could do to, to still have some success in those scenarios? Um. I'm really lucky in that I do work with a team that has a consistent model, but yeah, there are plenty of people um, I've seen who either have been fed the line that you've got this problem that we need to fix, or that's what they really firmly believe. Um, I like to look at the, it's a motivational interviewing, it's decisional balance, so what's good about that? You know, it helps you believe that you're, there's something that can be fixed, it helps you believe that there is a solution. It helps you have a degree of trust to know that somebody's got the answer. What's not so good about it? Well, I'm still waiting for it to work. <laughs> um, it's, you know, and and I do wonder, is, he, is that person tr telling me the truth? Is it real? And then I say, and where does that leave you? And you start with the good things in finish with the not so good things and wrap it up together and hand it back to say, so where does that leave you? What's your experience of this? I'm not making that decision. Um, one of the debates that constantly happens in my department is, should we keep pursuing finding the nociceptive input? Um, should we use injections? Because I work with musculoskeletal doctors. Um, and they say, well, you know, sh when should we stop? Well, it's actually not my decision and it's not their decision, it's the person's decision. What I find is that they're often not given, told that there are options. You don't have to go down that line of finding the cure. It's the self-management, living well with pain is often just never presented by different people. So when I can talk to them, we talk about the good parts of having a cure and then the not so good parts, which often involve a lot of waiting and what's happening with your life while you're waiting. What's happened to your relationships while you're waiting for that fix? And I wonder if that's working for you. How well is that working? I wonder what it would be like if we could start to build in some things that make you feel like you. And we're back to the other narrative. So to me, it's um, I don't diss the other people. I just suggest that we'll explore this together and push the responsibility back to that person. That's their job to decide how much they want to pursue that. But it's my job to, sh to say, that a self-management, a living well with pain is a positive choice. And it's been fabulous being able to show people um, Alison Sims' book, Pain Heroes, um, Jaleta Belton's wonderful, wonderful blog. You know, there are lots of people who live well with pain and to be able to show people, these guys are like you and me. There's no difference. They're just out there living, living a life and it's possible despite your pain and it's like a it's like a wave I just want to see that we have more of that living well with pain and who knows what's going to happen to the pain it may just fade away or we may find this cure and you can do that while you're pursuing your passive treatments you can start to build in these things that make you feel good and make you more you it's not a it's like the biopsychosocial model people say wow well, what about the bio well it's inclusive and it's exactly the same with this idea of starting to do things despite your pain and living well with your pain it's inclusive it's not an exclusive model no i love <laughs> that approach i think too often you know and i probably would be guilty of this is i just want to pull people away from this passive stuff and like no this isn't the way you should be doing it you need to be you know 
we're giving you self-efficacy and you're going to not. So I like that thought of being flexible to have that passive stuff on board, not, you know, casting judgment, having the patient kind of weigh the both sides of that coin, bring it back to them and say, you know, hey, we have a, a life that we'd like to get you back to live in those things that you mentioned. And, uh, you know, Linda had put a, a question up here as far as a counselor who asked people to describe their best day ever to help them discover meaningful activities. What do you think about that type of approach? It's another way to tackle it, um, but I think the risk is with somebody who's had pain for a long time and they are really demoralised um, and they just can't see their way through, which which happens um, very often. People who are in that first stage of making sense of their situation cannot see through to the future. They can't plan for the future. And I think sometimes what's your best day ever can remind them of the the things that they've lost so i would treat that with care um and just be a little you know you need to know the person um i guess some of the people that i've seen um we just could not go there i've got a lady at the moment who's withdrawing from opioids and i've seen her lying in bed not able to function at all not able to get out of bed because she's just so doped up She's now sitting, but she still can't see her way forward to what might she be able to do. So luckily, she's got a little a little puppy, a cute little bit on freeze um, ball of fluff, and that's starting to get her up and sitting and engaging. Um, so I'm using what's in her her environment to help her move, and later we'll see what else she wants to do. But I think. Kevin Polk suggests again, who is important to you and how can we help you be closer to them or build a life that's closer and helps them feel more like them? Yeah. Um, I'm curious, you've already alluded to this already with kind of your view on exercise for you because you deal with persistent pain, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I have fibromyalgia. For all that John Quint thinks it's not a thing, um, it's a convenient label for the widespread pain that I, I live with. Yeah, yeah, so for you, I mean, you're a perfect example. You know, physios, we have this tendency of, you know, exercise and you can't go wrong getting strong and all these different things that, uh, you know, personally, I, I don't think it's, you know, I think the, the, the thought is in the right place with that, but it's also not with the human who's experiencing the symptoms that may not resonate at all with them as far as um, things. So uh, I, I guess, what would you advise to, to physios to be better at tailoring maybe exercise for you, like you said, is gardening or maybe exercise for you is, is uh, you know, with your, with your uh, labs, your pups. Um, yeah. How do you, I mean, I think we we're kind of talking about already, already, but how would you recommend physios be a little bit more flexible with their application of, of exercise to fit that human being in front of them? Yeah, um, exercise is a vexed topic because if we go back, say, 100 years, who actually did exercise? It was yeah. never a thing. You didn't go to the gym. We've created this monster that seems to be the way that health professionals in particular think of this structured um and it's probably from i don't know war games and building soldiers strength and that kind of thing which is very good for a specific type of context but daily life's not like that it's much more variable um and in the olden days we used to have to beat the mats out with a carpet beater and we used to have to scrub the floors on our hands and knees and we did that sort of stuff and that was exercise as well so i think perhaps we can be much more flexible about exercise what is the purpose what are we trying to achieve if we're trying to achieve um down regulation um of pain for someone like me exercise is the wrong thing because I get post-exercise increase in pain and fatigue. And that's well demonstrated. There's lots of studies about, about that for people who happen to have this tendency with central um, changes. So telling me to do that, just don't even go there. Um, what I need to do is build up very slowly to stuff 
And what I find is things that I enjoy doing, I'll do more of. And there's long been this knowledge that exercise is only good if people do it. If they hate it, they won't do it. So what's the point? So let's make something that people love to do. And does it have to be the same thing every day? What's wrong with going for a walk along the beach one day, jumping on your exercise the next day because it's wet, or vacuuming in the house because it's, you know, messy, going and gardening another day, dancing. You know, three hours of dancing is actually a lot of work. And that's great. So could physios think about um, asking the person, what do you like to do? How do you like to move? What's your favourite thing for moving? Is it twister? <laughs> is it climbing a tree? Is it that you really like paragliding? Can we help you get there? Because in the end, we're not using exercise as corrective steps now, not nearly as much as we used to. So most of it's about actually, can we help you move, increase your self-efficacy, increase your tolerance to movement, and use those down-regulatory processes. And we can do that in a whole bunch of really cool ways that don't involve three reps of 10 or three, 10 reps of three, whatever it is that the physios do. Yeah. Um, but gym, some people love the gym, go for it. If that's what they love to do, fabulous. What about Taekwondo? What about Judo? What about all the martial arts? They're all things that people like to do. Do them. Cool fun. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's just what I think. And again, I'm going to speak from my own experience with, I used to, you know, when, when things didn't make sense clinically and I would be so much more okay, It's there's got to be more complex mechanics and arthrokinematics that I'm just not seeing. And it's going to take some more complex manipulative technique or something. And I think we've, and we still do this because you can still look at our landscape and continue education. We have like manipulation level 14 that you can take these days. Yeah, where, yeah. And to me, we're traveling down the road of making some, we're traveling down the wrong road of complexity. We're trying to make it a mechanical complexity when it's a human complexity. That's mm. the problem. And maybe we need to steer people into being a human and being the human they want to be or they once were that they want to start seeing again that yeah. maybe the pain is taken from them. I just think, you know. And it's, is, it a, is it a defect or is it a response to stuff? Yeah. Very often it's a response to. So moving normally is likely to put normal input back into that brain and that mm -hmm. nervous system. So, and the other thing that we need to remember is that variability is the thing. So you may be seeing something that you think is pathological, but maybe it's just that person's normal. And that's okay. So let's get them using that in a whole bunch of different locations, different demands, and not just physical demands, but contextual demands like who's watching or um, who's not watching. And, you know, just bring, bringing a whole lot more um, flexibility into that. That makes the job of a physio or a personal trainer much more complicated because you can't rely on a, a, a recipe of progression mm -hmm. so you have to think a little and start to listen to the person a lot i guess one of my fears is with the emphasis on um communication that we're going to end up with levels of certification you can become a certified communicator i really would hate that um we already have it with certified explain pain things um actually we've been doing this stuff since the 70s in fact, earlier than that, I all my career have been doing um, helping people understand what we know about pain mechanisms right from the beginning. And I've been doing this since the 80s. So I don't want to see us create a new industry that says you can become a professional communicator of something to do with pain. Actually, it's all of our jobs, just as it's all of our jobs to help people understand when and if they're ready to and if they need to about their neurobiology mm -hmm. same as we need to do the same about movement helping people understand that it's okay to do different positions and to try things out and to experiment and to play with things um the more we make it rigid and formulaic the less flexible we are in applying it and it keeps coming back to are we technicians or are we professionals? And I hope we're professionals. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, one thing we had kind of touched upon as well is, uh, and you actually, let me bring a comment up. Keith Meldrum, who we'll be seeing in Boston, he's part of a patient panel that the International Association for the Study of Pain is going to launch uh, for the first time. And Keith's yeah. like, I'm excited. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. I'm going to definitely be checking that out. But it's a, a great sign that we're moving in a good direction, that actually we're going to talk to patients and invite patients into our conferences. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, rajam has been doing that already. Uh, long yeah. over at the pain summit in San Diego, which you guys should all go to if you haven't. Um, but Keith talks about effective chronic pain management is most successful, in my opinion, when treating the individual and putting the aside the practitioner advice, which is exactly what we just talked about. Is yep. three sets yeah. of 10 or go to the gym or whatever our bias is or get, don't get wrong, getting strong, whatever. Um, maybe we should ask the patient what would bring them meaning and value and go that route, which I, I, I love that approach with it. Which is a, a non-medical approach it is a biopsychosocial approach one of the things we find i find is that we forget with treatment why has this person chosen to seek help we assume that it's because their pain is the problem and there's two clinical questions that i ask when i'm seeing somebody one is what is your main concern what is most important for you um and the other one is, why are you presenting in this way at this time? And what's maintaining that presentation? And you can add to that, what, what, will, what can we do to reduce your disability and your distress? That what's your main concern? You know, and often it's not the pain, it's the fear that I, I can't sleep, or it's going to be worse when I'm old. That, that's, and we, we tend to not remember that. Um, and the reason that somebody will come and seek treatment, those, those reasons are, why do they choose you? Well, probably because their folks go and see someone like you, or they've been told to by somebody in an insurer, or you've got great advertising. Um, why now? Well, because probably it hasn't been settling down like I thought it would. It's violating my expectations. I'm starting to worry. In fact, um, Ferriera and um, a bunch of colleagues did a big study looking at why people present with back pain. And it wasn't pain intensity. It was pain is getting in the way of what I want to be able to do. It's disability. And this is why the emphasis on pain intensity is not my focus i'm much more interested in it's getting in the way of something how can we help you get back to it or yeah. something like it yeah no i like that now we did also talk about your uh thoughts on the what we call the intervention of pain education um i know you have some some uh some opinions and i'd love I th and i think they're good ones that you should share because i think it's it's uh you've already touched upon some of the background behind that thought that you have there and I, before i even have you answer it i think it's always interesting like you know in pt we feel sometimes like oh we've really explained pain as something new and, and uh, amazing and i always would get my ego check when i talk to ot's who say mark we've been talking about cognition and and that stuff for a while and even women's health pts who said mark yeah, we've been discussing, you know, some complex psychosocial issues with patients for long before Explain Pain was published. So, yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, obviously, there's been some good movements and some good science coming from that. But, yeah, it's interesting how we kind of think we've we've uh, renamed it. But as, but let, back to the pain education piece, Tell, give us your kind of perspective and thoughts on that because I think it's a good one to, to hear. <laughs> So um, this is a soapbox, so I, I apolog I'm apologizing in advance. Um, but it's actually, I don't like that term, pain education, because what that does is focuses us on educating, on what we do. What we are trying to do is help this person understand their situation as much as we can. So we are helping people reconceptualize their understanding. And that's what we're doing. We're not doing education. We're helping somebody understand. That means we can't use a formula. Um, and yes, the technology has changed a little bit. And I think what's happened is that through the work of Lorimer and others, it's become much easier for a physiotherapist to feel confident that they're giving accurate information. But 
as I say, we've been doing this stuff. Um, the earliest references I can find is in um, Four Dice's work from um, the late 60s, and then um, Sternbach's work in the 70s, where it's absolutely crystal clear that they used the gate control theory to help explain why there is no one-to-one -one relationship between the injury or the tissue damage and the experience of pain. So this is not new. And it is, um, all that we've changed really is that we have changed the language a little bit. We have learned a lot more about neurobiology and now more people are saying it. The problem is that if there is an assumption that if this person reconceptualizes their pain, A, it should be all they need. No, they're fine now. So they'll just get on and move. Um, secondly, that it's going to change their pain. Now, for some people, it will reduce pain. Remember, when you're reporting pain on a 0 to 10 scale, that's a verbal behavior. And I don't know if you've ever tried to actually give a number. It's really hard. Um, in fact, you have to do quite a lot of cognitive processes to estimate what do they mean by a three? What is the most extreme pain I've ever had? And is that more than anybody else? How does that fit? So you're actually enacting a behavior. And so part of that is if you're an ED, and somebody, so an emergency room, somebody asks you what your pain is and you say three, do you think you're going to get some medication? Probably not. Probably not. So if you say it's a nine, you probably will. So that behaviour, that is a signalling communication that we are doing in that moment to say, this is so much, this is annoying me so much, I need some help. So when people are using, say, an explain pain model and we're giving pain education and that person reports that their pain intensity has dropped, at least some of that is the distress that's associated with that experience. So if you think that your pain is a really scary thing, it's going to kill you, it's a cancer and it means that you're about to die, you will inflate that number, not because you're inflating it on purpose, but because you're distressed about it. And that's why people will tell us, well, I've got 12 out of 10 pain. How can you have 12 out of 10 pain? Worse pain than the worst pain you can imagine. Even worse than the worst pain. So what you are getting there is um, a, an estimation of distress. So when we do these measures um, and showing that pain education is the thing and it reduces pain what you are getting is that reduction in distress much more i think than anything else because we have no other way of measuring pain intensity except through behavior verbal utterances what that means is though there are people saying look it will reduce your pain what it probably does and this needs to be tested i know probably reduces some distress and it might help people feel more confident that I can start to do things. And it's through the doing things that people start to experience something different. And this is why for some people, I never go down that route of explaining what's going on. They're not ready for it. They've got a very clear idea because I always ask people, what's your theory? You know, you've been told lots of things about your pain by lots of different people. How do you put all that together? Why do you think your pain keeps going on? And you'll get them, and some of them will come out with a very rigid, clear explanation, and it's not movable. Well, if I try to give that person a new understanding, they are probably going to bite back. They're not ready for it. Think of your stages of change. They're not even thinking about it. So it's more effective and kinder not to get that pushback because they will reject what you're saying, rather to help them experience something different. I wonder what would happen if we tried blah, whatever that might be. And then you don't need to go down this, I'm going to help you reconceptualize because they've already experienced it. And it's really effective. So I think any intervention must be based on a formulation. 
of what you see some hypotheses that hang together to explain why is this person presenting in this way at this time and what's maintaining that behavior. And that comes from a CBT approach and it's not new. Um, Turk and um, Lozier and Fordyce and Maine and all these wonderful people who've been doing pain psychology for a long time have introduced this. Mike Nicholas's um, spaghetti diagram um, of case formulation is really helpful. So I teach that because for me that is the only way that we're going to get beyond uh, tissues are this and everything else is peripheral, is not that important. We have to integrate it with our clinical reasoning from the beginning. Coming back to why I don't like it being called subjective because then we can disregard it, because what really matters is this objective biomechanical stuff. So one of the things I didn't realise about physiotherapists was that clinical reasoning is a diagnostic process. Well, my clinical reasoning is not. It's a case formulation process. And I hold these hypotheses about why this person's presenting in this way at this time very lightly until I test them out. because. Otherwise, I'm guessing. And, you know, yes, we guess. I'm experimenting with my patients, but we're going, we're doing it together. We're checking out, does this hold true for you in this context, in this context, in this context? So if I think anxiety is a big component, let's try that. Let's see what happens if you learn some down regulation and you learn to calm and you get a better understanding of what's going on. Does that change your experience, change your disability? And if that helps, chances are high using abductive reasoning that that's probably what's been going on. It's not, um, it's not the hypothetical deductive approach that we're used to. It's an abductive reasoning approach and it still needs to be verified. But that's actually good. It helps the person do the experimenting and be part of the process. And you yeah. can do that with a passive treatment too. You know, I think it's because you're, you have got a, I don't know, tight something. So let's see if we can together change that. And how how's that been? That's my hypothesis. I'll check it out. I'll test it. Does it does it help? I like that. <laughs> I like it. Um, I, just to go back because I think one of those pearls you put out there was just this: how this pain scale is just like a subjective behavior. It's a behavior. And it's a signal. It's the patient signaling to us their distress level. And this is where I still cringe when I see on social media these like memes that go around like, oh, your pain's a 15 out of 10, get real. Or like where we're just, we're totally yeah. like telling the patient that they're crazy for saying this. Yeah. I, I just think that is such a disservice to your patients to, to, to kind of invalidate what they're telling you. I've had patients tell me 30, 40, 100, whatever, and you yeah. just run with it they're telling you that they're suffering they're signaling that i'm in a bunch of distress here help yeah. me but instead yeah. we get clinicians who are well then they go in this dialogue with them about well so 10 out of 10 is an ambulance ride and like you've been shot so you're telling me you're you're beyond that and it's it's like yeah. such a waste of time to just it, and it's to me and it's, it's just they're the clients out the window with the with yeah the, well exactly it's that whole idea that we can judge somebody's um pain intensity as an outsider and we can't yeah so if somebody says that they're a 13 out of 10 that's what they are so i would reflect so it sounds like that's a really you're having a lot of trouble with managing that it's really bothering you mm -hmm. like i'd also add that one um oh, something i was just thinking about there um no it's gone it'll come back that's all right <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, uh, I mean, this has been great. I've really appreciated it. It's been about an hour and 10 minutes and we could probably go on for, for a while. And the questions of, of, uh, I think we don't, I don't see any uh, fresh ones on the board and I know you have two pups and, uh, hubby and kitty cat over there that you want to probably get back to as well and, and uh, enjoy your Sunday. So with that said, I just want to thank you so much for spending some time. I think we've all learned a ton just from listening to you and your perspective. I think, uh, for those of you who this is the first time encountering Bronnie, I highly would recommend you get to her blog and you start reading healthskills.wordpress.com. It's uh, and I'll put it on the uh, comments to this uh, live stream so you guys can check it out. 
Um, she's done a lot of great work there and it's free education and you get to learn a lot and you don't have to pay anything. She's so generous with her knowledge and her time. So thank you so much, Bronnie. It's a pleasure. It's been great and great conversations. And I got to be on my soapbox. All good. <laughs> I, hey, we love hearing people on their soapbox. It was respectful, you know, there, nobody, there was no name calling, nobody, uh, you know, I think we're all just trying to get better and we're all trying to help patients and it's not about us, it's about them and how we can better serve them. So thank you so much and thank you all who joined us and for you guys that are seeing it on replay, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it as well and definitely don't hesitate to throw some comments on the thread and we'll see if we can get back to those and answer them for you as they come. Have a good rest of your day.